Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our October 12th uh, Beef Brunch News Update. My name is Ashley Edwards, and with me today are Jason Holmes and Lee Falk. Uh, we are following up really on, I guess, Hurricane Delta came through last week. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and also talk about transitioning some into um, our cool season forages and, and those sorts of things. But Lee, I'm going to let you kick it off and talk a little bit about the field conditions, weather conditions that we have here in North Louisiana. Thank you, Ashley. Glad to be with everyone this morning. Uh, as we were rec recording this, we of course dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Delta and, um, and, and its effects on Louisiana. And North Louisiana, the, the effects were mostly rain. We, we didn't really get um, a whole bunch of a wind in North Louisiana. The farther east you go on, on the north end, uh, you, you picked up quite a substantial amount of rainfall. Uh, of course, the western areas of the region didn't get quite as much rain. Um, the wind was a little bit uh, of an issue farther south for us, but mostly uh, some, some flooding issues farther east in northern, northern Louisiana. As far as field conditions go, uh, our, our forage situation continues to be uh, good, uh, th though you do see the Bermuda grass starting to, to to back off a little bit, and and of course Bahia is as well. But as far as ryegrass planting goes, a lot of progress has been made across North Louisiana on getting some ryegrass in, and um, I looked at some prepared seed beds last week that were already up and doing good. I, uh, it's too early to tell yet, but uh, the moisture that we're getting, it it sure seems like it might be a pretty good year for ryegrass, but it's it's way too early to tell. Uh, folks are still weaning fall calves and um, and trying to get some fall uh, cattle works out of the way. But uh, generally speaking, things are progressing pretty good for this time of the year, especially getting the moisture. But uh, uh, we, we know that we've got our, our, our folks down in South Louisiana that have, and our cattle producers uh, uh, south that have really suffered here lately and our hearts go out to them. Y'all are in our prayers. Thank you, Ash. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, Vince Deza tells our counterpart in central South Louisiana, he could not join us this morning, but we did speak with him a little bit before we started recording uh, to get kind of an update on what Hurricane Delta did there. And he said, you know, there's still a lot of livestock that are displaced from Hurricane Laura. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to describe everything that's going on down there and put it into words unless you're there to see it. Um, but Hurricane Delta definitely brought more rainfall. Um, some areas are still flooded. I guess it's a good thing there wasn't quite the wind damage um, that we had from Hurricane Laura. But once you put those two hurricanes on top of each other, things are still pretty rough, especially in southwest Louisiana. Um, the guys that have planted ryegrass, I know Lee was just talking about that here in North Louisiana, but our southern guys, um, central guys, if you've planted, um, you know, might need to replant due to the flooding that's happened there. But there is still a window of opportunity to be able to do that. And even if you have not planted yet, there's still time to get your ryegrass out. Um, so just kind of everything Lee just mentioned, you know, our, our guys in South Louisiana are trying to do that on top of trying to recover from from the hurricanes. So uh, we also want to make you aware of a few resources um, that are out there. So Farm Bureau does still have the hay clearinghouse open. Um, so if you would like to donate or if you need to tap into that resource, um, you can look into Louisiana Farm Bureau hay clearinghouse. We'll make sure we have that link listed in the video and podcast descriptions for you. Um, Louisiana Department of Ag and Forestry also has resources listed on their, their website. We will give you that link as well. And then, of course, you can always reach out to your local extension agents. Um, so be sure you can call your uh, local LSU Ag Center office. Uh, I know Rodney Johnson in central Louisiana and Bradley Poussin in, in southwest Louisiana have kind of been some of our our guys that have been um, coordinating those efforts, but just call your local office and they'll make sure they give you the right number to reach out to for any assistance there. Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Will you talk a little bit about um, how to manage this fall forage gap that some of our guys might be seeing um, as we start to transition into our cool seasons? Yes, ma'am, thank you. So. Uh... We know that this time of year, typically starting around the first part of October, we start seeing these Bermuda grass and Bahia grass 
um, uh, grazing conditions start declining, uh, uh, shorter uh, daytime um, and cooler nighttime. And it uh, uh, just gets to be the to a point to where that uh, the growing conditions for those warm season perennials is just not uh, not optimal. So we see those uh, those forages start declining in nutritional value, uh, and they'll they'll really start declining uh, if you're if you're trying to graze some that's standing. Um, that'll decline uh, all the way out until December to the point to where it gets so wet that it just starts rotting and it's really not conducive to to dry, trying to graze those stockpile Bermuda grasses. Um, and the other side of that equation is, is that we're trying to put uh, cool season annuals in the ground. Uh, so there's a lot of things that will play into um, uh, how fast we can get that uh, that cool season annual up and ready to graze. So um, what is the planning date? Uh, what is the method of planning? Uh, what are the environmental factors? So all of those are going to play into how fast we can get that uh, that cool season annual like ryegrass up and ready to graze. So we know that there is a uh, a gap there uh, from whenever our warm season perennials uh, and our cool season annuals uh, when we can when we can stop grazing those and when we should stop grazing those and whenever we can stop grazing those cool season annuals. So what I encourage everybody to do is uh, um, get a grasp on your baseline of forage. Um, so that base being stored forages, um, more than likely, uh, Bahia grass haze, Bermuda grass haze, um, are the ones that are going to be most popular. So if you don't know what the nutritional value is of those stored forages, it's difficult to manage your nutrition of that cow herd during this gap. Um, so I'm just going to give you some uh, some baseline numbers. So. Uh, if you've got a 1,200 pound gestating cow uh, from middle one third of pregnancy to last one third of pregnancy, she needs about seven to eight percent crude protein, and she's taking in about 21 to 24 pounds of dry matter a day. Uh, TDN values, total digest digestible nutrients, she needs about 50 percent to 54 percent. So seven to eight percent crude protein, that's not very difficult to achieve. I mean, we can. We can achieve that through a Bermuda grass or Bahia grass stored forage fairly easily. Uh, 50 to 54 percent TDN. We're getting we're getting on up there. We're 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 pressing our limits a little bit in terms of TDN. But uh, if we do a good job of managing those forages, uh, whenever we're putting those into a bale, um, we know that we can do that. So typically, on a average to high quality Bermuda grass, Bahia grass hay. Uh, we can meet those nutritional needs with that stored forage. On the flip side of that, if you've got cows lactating, so 1,200 pound lactating cow, first 30 days after calving, uh, if she's taking in about 27 pounds of dry matter a day. Uh, crude protein needs to be around 10%. TDN needs to be around 59%. Uh, so you know, we've got to be putting up a uh, a very high quality Bermuda grass hay to get into that 10% crude protein range, uh, but 59% TDN on a warm season perennial is pretty tough to do. Um, so we know that we've got to be able to supplement some sort of energy whenever we get to that point. That energy can be in the terms of a high quality ryegrass baleage, uh, or it may be in the terms of a uh, some sort of grain, so a dry distiller's grain, a corn gluten feed, uh, corn, and that's where our energy is going to come from uh, in a fed diet. So um, get a grasp on your uh, on what your hay quality is, um, and that's that's going to be what you're going to be leaning on whenever you don't have those forages that you can get out there and graze. Um, any of us can help you get that achieved. Um, it's a very simple process. It's uh, very inexpensive. Uh, if you're talking about just getting a, a hay sample done, you're talking like $15. It's the best $15 you'll spend uh, in order to get a grasp on what your, what your baseline forage is uh, whenever you're trying to meet those nutritional demands in a, in a gap between our, uh, our forages that we can graze. Um, so anytime you want to uh, visit about that, uh, reach out to myself, Lee, Ashley, Vince uh, at any time and we can uh, uh, we can kind of guide you in the right direction. 
uh, give you some pointers or even come out and uh, and help you get that achieved. But uh, uh, very, very important practice for us to be able to uh, meet the nutritional demands um, of these uh, of these lactating cows. And even if we if we're working with a very low quality stored forage, uh, we may even have to be supplementing uh, feeding those type forages as well. Uh, so please reach out to us anytime we can help you. Thank you, Ashley. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, we're going to transition a little bit um, real quick and talk about some events that we have. So uh, I guess it's been a couple weeks now. My calendar is getting jumbled, but we had the artificial insemination class at the Hill Farm and that went really well. Um, with COVID, we had to kind of shrink our class size just a little bit, but um, the class was really successful and it was beautiful weather. I think that's the first time in a handful of years we haven't had some sort of rain or, or gross um mist going on during that class. But uh, coming up at the Hill Farm, we do have a pregnancy determination class. Uh, Lee, will you talk just a little bit about that and how they could potentially get registered if we still have some spots available? Yes, thank you, Ashley. So so on November, we have two opportunities to attend a pregnancy determination clinic at the Hill Farm. Both of them are in November. One is November the 10th and one is November the 12th. This is a one day clinic that focuses on pregnancy management in cattle, pregnancy as the name states, and um, also discusses some issues relating to uh, uh, management, as, as I said. So these are, are two one-day clinics. The space is very limited. We, we teach all methods of pregnancy determination. We, uh, we, we give examples of ultrasounding. No, that's not really that uh, popular with commercial cattlemen, but we do go over it because it is a, a very viable tool. Um, we do we uh, cover blood testing to determine pregnancy and also pal, uh, uh, pregnancy determination by palpation. This is a very good program that we put together with the area of veterinarians, large animal veterinarians that actually act as in, instructors on several of these topics. And we really look forward to, uh, to having this. This will be our second year having these clinics. So if you need any information or would like to sign up, please reach out to any one of us who's going to be publicized today. Uh, I'd caution you that uh, space is very limited for this. So if you or someone you know is interested, they need to get in touch with us as soon as possible to get uh, space reserved. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Jason, it's time for our market update, please, sir. All right, so in the five area feeding region of uh, fed steer negotiated calf sales, sales closed the week at 106 to 110. Uh, that's about a dollar to three dollars higher than a week ago. Uh, most recent quotes uh, on futures show December futures were trading up 27 cents at 112, February down 35 cents at 114, and April down 35 cents at 116. Five to 600 pound steers sold between 129 and 135, uh, which is $2 to $9 lower than a week ago. So we're continuing to see, uh, which we historically do, those uh, those calves just finding a hard place to go this time of year. Uh, a lot of that is being driven right now uh, because of the dry conditions and the wheat belt. Uh, there's not a lot of wheat, uh, wheat grazing to be had right now. They're uh, experiencing some drought conditions. So, uh, that's going to greatly start affecting uh, those uh, those lighter weight calves. Seven to eight hundred pound feeder steers sold between one twenty one and one thirty eight, uh, so they're steady to about four dollars higher, higher than the previous week. Uh, November futures on the same class uh, 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 down fifty five cents at one thirty five. January down sixty cents at one thirty four, and March down sixty two cents at one thirty four. Uh, lean coal cows remain steady from the previous week, so they range from 41 cents to 50 cents, so they're holding steady. Uh, the latest import and export trade data was released this week, uh, so that would cover the month of August, uh, so those are delayed a month. Uh, beef exports were up 2.5%. Uh, that was the first month above year ago levels since uh, pre-COVID in March. Um, those exports are expected to continue uh, modest growth for the remainder of the year. So that's uh, that's always good whenever we see those export numbers coming back up. In our feedstuffs mar in our feedstuff markets, uh, rice brand trading steady at $100 a ton. 
Uh, soybean meal trading uh, up $29 at $369 a ton. Soybean hull steady at 110 a ton. Cotton seed meal up $20 at $287 a ton. Whole cotton seed up $5 at $215 a ton. DDGs are trading steady at $145 a ton. Uh, corn gluten feed up $12.50 at $530 a ton. And corn trading up about $0.08 cents at $3.86 a ton. So uh, a lot of those soybean markets right now are being driven by the drought in Brazil. So Brazil being a, a large player, a world player in terms of soybeans, uh, uh, they're experiencing drought conditions. So uh, uh, that's what's driving a lot of those soybean markets that are that are running up right now. Uh, that's all we got in the markets, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. So just to wrap up again, um, the resources we mentioned earlier in terms of hurricane relief, or even if you want to donate, uh, those will be in the description uh, below the video or in the podcast description. Uh, we are officially on Apple Podcasts, so if you're a podcast subscriber, you can check us out on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Um, we're also on some others like Overcast and Pocket Cast, and so I'll put a link to uh, those below as well. And then tomorrow is our uh, monthly webinar. So um, again, for the Beef Brunch Educational Series, we have these news updates, and we also have monthly webinars. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the use of estrus synchronization for natural service. Um, so what benefits you can see uh, if you use simple synchronization protocols and still turn your bulls out. So Jason and I are going to be going over that. It's a live event uh, at 1030 tomorrow. And so you can join us on our um, website, which is uh, lsuagcenter.com slash beef brunch. Um, that will be this month. We will also get that posted on the YouTube channel and on the website. If you're not able to join us live, you can still go back and watch that. Um, so we hope that you're all having a great fall. Um, we're sending our thoughts and our prayers out to everyone affected by Hurricane Delta. And again, please reach out to any of us if there's anything that we can do to help you out. Thank you.